Hello, everybody. Welcome to the latest from our Global Insight series, where we delve into the career paths of leading industry professionals and ask them to share the secrets of their success. I'm Mark Clement, a broadcaster with BBC Radio and Television and also an event host, including working with UCFB and the Global Institute of Sport on various projects, including hosting their Future Leaders Graduates Conference and also their recently launched Global Summits, which take us to Melbourne, New York, Atlanta, Toronto, and soon to be Miami. And at the age of 33, our guest today has an enviable CV. Just listen to this. 18-year domestic career in women's football, won 11 trophies, including the quadruple in her first year with Arsenal. She also played for her beloved Birmingham City twice, went over to the States with Chicago Red Stars, then finished her career at Chelsea. She amassed 144 England caps. She's got two degrees and she's working for a third and in the 18 months since she retired, Karen Carney, MBE, has forged a notable reputation as a pundit with the BBC and BT Sport. So here's the thing, out of all you've achieved with your life so far, which bit do you think mum and dad are most proud of? Oh, um, I think my mum would be proud of me playing for England, my senior. I think my mum's proudest moment is is when I used to sing the national anthem. I think my dad, he's never really said what he's most proud of, if I'm brutally honest. Um, but I'd probably say from, from my mum, it would be, you know, playing for England and, and the debut and stuff like that. I think she was always really proud of that. And I'm sure my dad was as well, but uh, he, I think typical dad sometimes they don't really say too much. Yeah, there's always one parent like that, isn't there? But you have their unconditional love at the same time. I mean, yeah. you know, when it comes to National Anthem, actually you brought, with you bringing this up, did you plan what you were going to do, whether you were going to be really loud and proudly bang it out or whether you were going to mumble humbly or did it just hit you that moment um I think it's different you know I think when you're a young player you're a bit nervous to sing it um but I think as I got older I got more passionate and about it because I knew that you you're never ever always going to do it and I, I think I got emotional watching it I can't remember what game I was at it might have been the under 21s I did recently and the boys were singing it and I got a little bit emotional because I, I, I missed it. And it was something I said in my retirement interview that they said, what's the one thing you're going to miss? And I said, singing the national anthem, because it's a moment where you're on the pitch, you're with your teammates, you're opposite your teammates as well. And you're, and you're managing your staff, but also all your family are in the crowd. And for that moment, it's for them a little bit. So I always felt like I was singing the national anthem for them. I had my, my family's name on the back of my jersey. I had my England badge on the front singing the national anthem, which I was very, very passionate about. So I think that that for me was a big moment. And I, I got a little bit emotional watching the boys do it the other day. I mean, 144 England caps. Did you Did it ever at any point become routine? Did you ever take it for granted or was it always without question special no it, it's it's always special it definitely is it is always special I think but in in any form of job sometimes you do take certain elements for granted and then you get an injury or you get not picked and then you realize um or you start to get older and you think oh I can't move like I used to this might not last as long as I, I thought it would um but even on days off when you when I thought oh man you know, I wasn't up for his other games. I still think I knew what it meant to play for England and sing the anthem and represent your country. And my family, I have to give a lot of credit to them. I felt they they tried to keep my feet on the ground at all, all possible times. And my sister always taught me, you know, that I always borrowed the England jersey. It was never mine. It was always borrowed. And you borrow it for as long as you can. And after every game, you give it back and you might not be in the privileged position to get it back again. So... I always, maybe that's why I got 144, because they kept me driven and, and kept me relatively grounded at times. 
I mean, I get the impression when your career came to an end, there was there was one line I read in an interview from you. I want now I want some time for me. I mean, you'd had what eight major tournaments. You'd had the Olympics. You'd had the two spells with your beloved Birmingham, the whole Arsenal success story over to the States, back with Chelsea. Were you absolutely knackered physically and mentally? Yeah, definitely. I think I was, uh, I reckon I'd had burnout a couple of times and I actually did nine back-to-back -to -back tournaments. And, uh, you know, that, that in itself is mentally and physically draining, probably more so mentally and never, ever, People think you have enough season, but you don't because you're still training, you're still thinking, you're still pushing, you're still signings. There was never enough period. There was never enough button for me. Um, and I was definitely, physically, I could have played on, but mentally I was gone. There was, there was nothing more. I was drained of every ounce of energy and passion and fire. I couldn't do it anymore. And um, it's probably taken me a year, and I've still not probably got it back yet, the, the, the passion and the love for the game. I'm always passionate about it, but if someone said you want to go and have a kick around, I wouldn't go and do it. I mean, I've, I've been asked quite a lot to play five a side, and it has taken me a year to play again. Um, but it just took everything out of me. But that's what it should do. I think it should take everything out of you. You're playing for your country. You're playing for top clubs. If you're the, the true professional, which I tried to be, it should take every ounce of energy out of you. What about regrets? Um, I'm caught up in two minds about that because, like, my journey made me who I am, even, f like, the failures and the setbacks that, you know, defined me at times. But there would be – it's a weird point. I got injured when I was 21 in America, and at that point, you know, I'd – Okay, it broke on the scene as a 17 year old <clears throat> excuse me and my aspirations was to be the top top three players in player in the world and I thought I could do it you know at, at 21 I'd had 50 caps from my country I was playing professional in America I was holding my own in the states and thought you know I'm only 21 you know I've got five six more years to really really peak there's no reason why I shouldn't and I got injured and I never recovered I never got back to the levels I was at mentally in particular and physically um probably because of the mental battle of it so a big regret in mine was probably not getting to maybe the levels i thought i i could have got to um but however not getting to those levels made me get a master's made me have other areas that i had to explore and be a better person really so i think i might have lost in that but i think i gained in others and Probably the last regret again, but if I'm a 100 metre sprinter, it's a bit different, but I'm in a team sport. Yeah. Would be I didn't win a gold medal in my country. I won every other trophy. I've got a silver medal for England. I've got a bronze medal for England. I never got the gold. And I think that will always probably eat at me a little bit. I mean, who helped you in terms of emotional self-management? And, and were the qualifications that you did, I mean you know, degree in sport and exercise science, physiology and sport psychology, and then, you know, your master's in sport performance psychology was, was part of that future career, but was part of it self-management where you were still playing, that you could take bits of it and apply it to yourself? Yeah, I think the sport science degree was, I was at Loughborough, I went there when I was 16, so I was on a scholarship and I did my two years A-levels and then I did my degree um but i never ever thought i would ever go to university i wasn't i'm not a very academic person i don't like reading i don't like writing um dyslexic so i i struggle with it massively so football they kind of made me do it and it was great and uh i thought i with hard work i can do it and then obviously i, I went to america and got injured and, and suffered quite badly with depression and quite a few issues and when i came back to get some rehab and some help my um you know, we have kind of said, go and do a master's in psychology so that you understand more about your behaviours and kind of why you might do certain things and have a better understanding. And also it was a massive topic at the time or a niche that needed to be investigated. And then that's why I did it. And, um, you know, I was really, really proud of that. And that's probably 
the Masters is probably one of the proudest things I've done. Probably not above football because I think football comes not easy, but it it comes natural to me where studying doesn't. So to get my Masters was a challenge um, and I found it very, very hard, but it was probably one of the most accomplishing things I've ever done. Um, so yeah, I'm really, really happy about that. And, and now I've stupidly signed up to do an MBA. So uh, I'm studying again. Wow. I mean, you mentioned dyslexia. I mean, there'll, there'll be some of the students from UCFB and GIS who maybe do struggle with concentration discipline with regard to their studies. How did you get yourself on course and overcome that particular hurdle? Well, I didn't realise I had it till I was, I think, till I was in America. And uh, when I was at school, I would, when everyone else was reading books, I would have a book and <clears throat> the Simpsons comic underneath. So it looked like I was reading a book, but I was actually reading a comic because I, I couldn't, I just didn't want to read. I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. I didn't have the attention span. And I also struggle with sayings. I say them backwards a lot in terms of, you know, like um, someone just said, you know, you put a name to a face or a face to a name. Those type of sayings, I get confused easily. Um, if I knew then what I know now or stuff like that, I, I really struggle with. Um, and numbers as well. Like if we speak a number out, I, I, sh I sometimes struggle with that. But um, what, I, what I did was when I came back from America for my master's, I actually took um, a year to prepare for going into it. So I, I, I did like kids workbooks, you know, laugh. So I, I went to WH Smith's and got workbooks and, 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 and did those and prepared for it. And then I did an online course to kind of prepare me to get back into studying again. Um, and that's how I did it. But I still struggle with it now. It takes, a, I find it the hardest starting an assignment, that initial part, because I, I sit down at a computer and I could easily verbalise to you what I want to say. And if it was a, you know, an, an audio uh, present, an audio kind of uh, marking, I'd nail it. But my ability to put it onto paper, I can't do. So it, it takes a lot of time and takes a lot of preparation. So, Wow. That says, that says a woman with two major qualifications already and aiming for a, for a third. Did you, did you share that situation with anybody or did you shield it and try and keep it private and deal with it yourself? When I was doing my degree at Loughborough, I didn't realise I was dyslexic until I was – told it in America um, and it was a relief when I got told because I just thought I thought I was stupid if I'm being brutally honest and I shared a, a room at Loughborough and my roommate was on the same course and she was absolutely just nailing everything and I'd just sit there and I it was just a stress of anxiety not understanding my mind's telling me so many things and I can't put it to paper and it's really infuriating so it was actually a relief when I got kind of said, you're dyslexic. And then it was like, right, I can do something about it. I can help myself and I can get support. And um, so, yeah, it was, a, it was a relief, actually. But for 20-odd for years, I didn't know. And um, I think that's quite hard. I mean, you mentioned your mental health. And I don't want to pry if you don't want to go into too much detail. But was there a, was there a, a trigger that set that off was it was it a residual and 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 how did you manage to manage it concurrent with being a high profile footballer yes yeah, so i think uh i guess i was probably dormant depressed for quite a while i think football kind of was my escapism and, and, and kept me afloat really at times but i wasn't i wasn't right for quite a large period of time so i think when i was 16 my mum was was sick quite bad um but I had football so I think it probably started then if I'm being brutally honest and then when I moved to America my mum got sick again quite bad and this time though I got injured so I didn't have the escapism of football so I was a 21 year old in America on my own with no family no friends and at the time no teammate and I was having to have surgery so that's really daunting for a young a young girl and I was younger even though I was 21 I probably had the the age mentality of a 17, 18 year old. Um, for living in America, having to deal with an operation there, understanding how they work um, and having nobody around me and, and got into a very, very bad situation. So that was the trigger for me, not having a release. So 
that forced me then to realise I can't rely on football to have that release anymore. I've got to build myself on concrete and not build myself on sand because I will always crumble because my foundations are not right. So um, that that's what happened to me, really. And then I, I, I got a lot of support. I put a lot of hard work in, did some rehab um, for a few years. And, yeah, for I think for about four or five years, I probably only three people knew how bad and how severe I was. They just all thought I was moody and miserable. Um, which I'm not, but uh, I can give that across sometimes. But um, no, I think, you know, only three or four. And then my family didn't really know. And I released an article, uh, I think, with the Times. And, and that's when I was honest. And then everyone kind of went, oh, OK. And I think at me at that point, I couldn't go to people and tell people. But there was always a two plus two was five with me. Something didn't add up if you if you tried to, to figure me out. So I thought, I'm just going to make the calculation myself so people know what's actually going on and what's happened and actually help other people because it's it's real it happens and you, you've got to deal with it hmm. i can concur those of you watching that that karen does have a very moody persona we do a photograph sometimes clanning about when we've been in the studio for final score and sometimes we do a kind of an, an arty posed one and she's always at the front well you call it sultry don't you and i just go no you just look you look like you've seen your bottom yeah, to me, that moody looks natural, so I nail it every week. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned only two or three people knew about your situation. What about mentors along the way? What about people that you've been able to turn to, to be open, honest, vulnerable with? And I suppose I'll, because of your, your connections along the way, I'll always think of Emma Hayes as maybe being a, 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 a major support for you. Yeah, well, when I was in America, she was the one that said, you need to go home. Um, and that's why I came back. I gave up my professional career because of my mental health. You know, it was either stay there and maybe not be here today, um, in, a, in a broader sense, if I'm being brutally honest. So she kind of forced me back and really helped that. And I'll be forever grateful for her for that. Yeah, she, she's a mentor. But I'm really lucky. I've, I've had a lot of people. I, I realised that when I came back from America, it's about having a support team and you're You'll find that with a lot of athletes, actually. I read um, Andre Agassi's book, and a lot of people felt that he was really arrogant and kind of insular, and it was actually when that's not the case a lot of the time. Sometimes that we trust our inner circle. We That's our bubble. That's our support team, and we go to them. They're our go-to people, and I'm no different. I ha had quite a few good supportive people that knew the situation and, and were willing to stick by me and support me and all of that and um you know I like to think I'm there for them at this moment in time that I haven't forgotten that they were there for me at rock bottom and you know when you have good times you don't forget about them as well because they're the people that count that are there for you through thick and thin Hmm. Talking of of good times, uh, we kind of skipped forward a wee bit. What was that? What was the sort of start of your interest in football, and then realizing you were quite good at it? Take us through those early sort of stages, and then getting signed think, for Birmingham. I think it started when um, my mum just didn't want me around the house as a, as a kid because I had too much energy, and like I said, probably <laughs> now looking at it, dyslexic, I just didn't want to sit still. So uh, she was like, right, after summer camp you go with you, with the people from school, the lads from school, the girls from school or whatever. And I just went on like multi-sports camps and, you know, without blowing my trumpet, sport came really easy to me. Um, but then football was like really, really fun. It was like, I, c I couldn't, again, maybe going back to the school thing, I wasn't able to express myself as a kid, but with football, it was like another level, but... I was also a dancer as well, so I did dancing and football. And uh, so that's where it, it kind of started, really. And, um, yeah, I, I I don't know. I just I just loved it. And also, I think my passion for football, it does come from my parents and my sister because they're Mad Blues fans. And, you know, at eight, they took me to Wembley for the auto windscreen final. And, you know, my sister is, is 12 years older than me. She couldn't – she didn't have to play. So she was a referee and a coach. And I just think football has always been involved in my family. There's, there was always just one rule in, in, in my household is you support Birmingham, you don't support Villa. Um, and I just think my family love it. They, My mum loves it, my dad loves it. And I just think it's just innate and it was always going to be in me. But I think playing-wise, they just shipped me off to summer camps. And I just, 
I think football kind of chose me. I didn't choose it, so it was quite sweet. What a what a life of contrasts you have you have had. There've been some real lows in there, but there's there's just moments when you're you're just brimming with happiness, telling these tales. So take me to the ultimate. What was the point at which you realised you were darned good and thought, Do you know what, I've made it here. Um, I don't think I ever felt that. Never. I I, I don't think I ever felt. I was darn good. I don't. I, don't. I think he. No, I Hold don't on. ever. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on, Cass. 144 England caps, 11 trophies, <laughs> nicknamed the Wizard. You don't think you were? You don't think you were darn good? I think mean, that just happens to anybody. No, no. But I think it, what, what I'm trying to say is I don't think those are accolades. Those those happen. But when you're trying to accomplish you know, 143 caps to 144. There's no at one point where I go, oh, I'm darn good. Um, there's there's times when you're you're in the lineup and you you fake it. I always used to say fake it till you make it. You tell yourself, right, I'm quick, I'm strong, I'm good, I can take her on. But the and they're the kind of that's that ego of being on the pitch. You have to have an ego on the pitch. But I don't think I ever felt I'm darn good. Uh, you obviously know that you're good to get to the level that you're at. But for me, I never, ever, and I think maybe that was my Achilles heel, if I'd have believed myself and had the ultimate confidence, I think I might have achieved even more. But you, for me, you never, ever rest on your laurels. You, I remember when we won the quadruple with us, we didn't celebrate it because it was expected. When we, you know, we won trophies. I remember we never celebrated trophies with Arsenal because it was just a done thing. And I think that's where you might go, we didn't believe we were that good, you know. We just did what we had to do, and um, I just think that's the mindset of of never being like when you do nine back to back tournaments. Like there's always a next one, so you never have that ability to think like that, which is really weird. Yeah, there must be. You must have to have some sort of release of satisfaction, even if it's for they used to say of Sir Alex Ferguson, didn't they? He would enjoy sort of twenty four, thirty six hours. And he would have a couple of glasses of wine and just let his guard down a bit. And then he would start. But surely there the must have been a buzz of satisfaction. Otherwise, why have you done it all this no, time? The, the, don't get me wrong. There's an absolute satisfaction. I mean, you know, when I won the FA Cup with Birmingham, I think I went out for 24 hours and had a pizza, curry and McDonald's all in like, the space of 10 hours along with about 10 pints. So, um, <laughs> You don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm human. I will. I will. But I think that comes with experience from knowing that Arsenal, we didn't celebrate the good times, that when those good times did happen, they're very, very rare. And a lot of the Arsenal players say that now, if we could go back, we would celebrate. We just didn't know what an achievement that we've done. So when I went to Birmingham, when I went with Chelsea, yeah, I absolutely celebrated. But that celebration lasts 24 hours because... Same as England jersey, it's only borrowed, so you, you've got to go and borrow that trophy back again. London 2012, representing Great Britain. I mean, that must have been surely a real buzz, wasn't it, with all that was going on in the country? I think for me that was one of the, the best days because um, it's every boy's dream to play at Wembley. And um, that day we, we, we changed the whole perception that it could be a little girl's dream as well, which was awesome. So... It was. I remember that day because we played Brazil. We'd already, we were already through. I think there was just under eighty thousand people in the stadium. Um, we beat Brazil, got an assist, played really well. And then as we got back on the coach and back to the Olympic Village, because it was a late kickoff, it turned midnight, and it was my birthday then. So everyone on the coach sung happy birthday to me, and I was like, "What a great, what a great birthday!" You know, majority of the time I was always away from my birthday. At a tournament um <laughs> but i thought if you're gonna have a birthday that's not a bad one to have that is not bad at all is it um what what do you think about this the sort of direction that the women's game in england is going now obviously we had the american invasion in the, the summer do you see it moving gradually towards another level again i hope so i hope it keeps growing but i hope it's growing at a manageable rate i think again the analogy i would use build it on concrete not sand um with we need good infrastructure and, and and hopefully that will happen but i think you know at the world cup we got just under 12 million people watching that semi-final game so it says a lot about the growth of the game 
we need to get a WSL stronger. Hopefully, when all being well with with people allowing back into games, we'll get some good attendances back for the WSL again. The big one for me is England has to win a major tournament. Um, we've got the Euros coming up. We're hosting it, so I think to really cement women's football on the map, we need England as a national team to, to win it, um, and and that would be a big, big moment for for the country. I think. Now, what about you? So you de you decide to retire. How long had you been preparing to move into the media, and how does it come about? Because it feels to me like you you've made a huge impact in a very short period of time but was there a lot of preparation went into it or was it a call out of the blue a chance meeting how did it happen i think i think in 2013 i got i got injured and i got asked to do uh radio um in birmingham to to do one of the birmingham city, city women game and while i was that like, injured and i enjoyed it actually i was terrible probably looking back now i was awful but I, I enjoyed it and, and what it did for me being injured, it, it made me feel apart. I learned the game, I studied the game tactically. Um, so I was given that opportunity and then I just got opportunities while I was playing, just do TV here, there and, and everywhere and a bit more radio. And I actually started doing Blues men's games and I thought, this is quite a good little gig. You know, instead of, you know, I've got the day off on a Saturday because I've got my game tomorrow, I'll commentate on a men's game, get to watch my beloved Blues free and they get to talk about it I'm like why would I not do it and, um yeah so it was pretty um pretty cool actually and and then I think I started to probably three years before I was retiring uh started to just be more open-minded to different things then like you know I got in a mentorship scheme with Santander the bank opening my eyes and opportunities to the corporate world and then I got more involved in TV and BT asked me to do a few more stuff and still involved in the radio. And, and then I got an agent who kind of met me and rang me up really out of the blue and said, I, I want to talk to you. Met him at Cobham and he's like, I think you could do stuff in the media. And and that was it really. And I think then I knew with about a year of my career left, I wasn't so sure I was going to retire. But uh, my agent just said, look, we're in a good position. You just need to give me three or four months when you think you're going to retire and I'll ask questions um, and, and we'll see where it goes. But it literally started because I was injured and it was something I enjoyed. And um, yeah, it, it, I didn't ever envision I would be doing what I'm doing now for sure. I mean, did, did the periods out with injury prepare you for that moment when you did hang your boots up and you woke up one Monday morning and you could sit on the sofa in your pants and have a cup of coffee and not have to worry about being routinized and that structure all around you. And you had complete and total freedom to do what you wanted and go wherever you wanted to go. That's scary. That's scary. That was scary. I rang my agent and I said, I've, I've, got, I've got two days off. I don't know what to do. And he was like, rest and relax. And I'm like, I've never done this before. I don't know. Wow. I don't know what to do. I've never been all our life, you know, I've been told what to eat, when to eat, where to be, manage my time. Everything has been so calculatively done for me. So to wake up, not have a place to go, a job to go to, a physical output to do, it was like, what the hell do I do now? I felt a little bit lost. Um, and that that's really challenging. I can totally understand why people go off the rails when they retire. I totally get it. Yeah. And the, the thing that saved me was running and also having the preparation that I did that, you know, when I did press the eject button, I did have work to go into. And that was that was probably one of the smartest things that I've ever, ever done is prepare properly for it and not just ad hoc. But not everyone has that luxury. People get career ending injuries. People don't get contract renewal. And sometimes it's a shock element. But um, I think, yeah, it's just. Like I said, I never thought I'd be I'd be going into the media, and I'm really lucky and privileged that I've had this this opportunity to do it. But um, that moment of not waking up going to to Chelsea is exciting, but is very very scary, and I still think it's something I'm adjusting to. Yeah, I, and and do work on because I know you work with Visa on their athlete transition program. It's a it's something I've done a bit of work on as well, and the amount of athletes whether they have had a top level elite career or whether they're at the bottom end that just don't prepare for it Kaz they just 
hit this cliff top drama and I have a conversations with some quite high profile people who have to build whole new routines you know maybe get a gym an hour's drive away so they've got the routine of an hour to drive to the gym do their session have a cup of coffee bite to eat an hour's drive back and a block of their day is taken care of it I mean it's it, it feels like quite a scary place for a heck of a lot of people and of course a lot of them they end up in with mental health problems and addictions and separations from partner rates are extraordinarily high. I mean, there's some very sad cases out there. You must be encountering them as part of the, the corporate work you're doing, are you? Yeah, I think that's why when Visa asked me to, to come on board, they, they saw I'd retired. They were keen to start a, an athlete transition program, primarily for women's football. And they asked me to get involved. And I was like, yeah, it's, it's a no brainer. We, we need to help the players. And I think the, the way that you prevent a poor retirement is by having a better transition by starting young. So literally just before this call, the reason why I was a couple of minutes late was because I was speaking to a football club, a WSL club, you know, speaking to the whole squad um, with Hope Powell on the call and talking about the programme that we're delivering. And, you know, two 17-year-olds are going to sign up to it because you have to have a dual career. You you can't be naive to think that the minute that you retire and finish football that you've got, you've got financial stability because not even top male players now have you see them all trying to do the same thing there has to be a mental stimulus as well so um i'm really really proud to be a part of that the second half program with visa and um i'm proud to to help other people transition out of football because you're right the the mental health and and the the lack of structure is, is a big issue and you just don't want to see people struggle now listen you you've shared one or two of of life's traumas and some of your vulnerabilities and things so let's deal with the elephant in the room what about the criticism you female pundits get from neanderthal man for daring to pass comments on men's football how have you coped with it um well look first of all i don't think i think it's pundits in general that get a real rough time i've, I've seen a lot of yeah my male counterparts get shocking abuse like shocking i am I'm pulled by the stuff that's sent to them as well. Yeah. Um, I really am. I, I just don't know how people have the audacity to do it. Yeah. In terms of, of me as a, as, a, as a female, I thought I had barriers playing football. I thought, you know, people tried to prevent me, stop me, have negative comments about me playing football. And I thought, great, you know, it took 10 years to break down that barrier, maybe actually 20 years. Um, were there I thought great you know we're at a point now and then I went into the media and I'm like well I'm back to being 11 years old again um that we broke down the barriers that females can play and now I've got to try and help this next generation believe that females can commentate or speak about football um and it's difficult it's challenging it bothers me it affects my mental health it definitely does um it's brutal it really really is but like i said it's not just females it's it's the male pundits get it as well and i think we have to support each other and i just think i, I you have to be on social media in the job that we do it, it's the reality in the world that we're in but there has to be better provisions to stop people being keyboard warriors and saying what they think if, if you wouldn't say in the street you can't type it don't type it but they do but they do and you must manage that situation i mean I, you know I, I I love it. I, I, you know, I know it's a big part of how we should promote ourselves and promote good causes. I get it. But there will always be somebody, even if 99.9% .9 of the population agree with your stance, there'll be somebody who thinks they have the right to this most rabid abuse. So, for example, Saturday, if I'm working in the TV studio, topping and tailing with radio, I don't look from about midday till I get on the train on the way home at about seven o'clock because... You know, if, if, if you feel people are picking over your every line, it would undermine you. Are you the same or have you learned to sort of go, oh, idiot, and move on? I mean, how what do, you, do, you, do you look during the course of the program? I can never see across to what you're doing sometimes. <laughs> I don't know whether you're looking at your going um, <laughs> no, I, I can't see the screen, so I'm probably usually doing that. <laughs> uh, I don't wear my glasses. So, um, no, I think... I did when I was still playing. I did the grave error, and I was on with Jake Humphreys on BT, and I looked at my Twitter or something like that at half time, 
And he went, no, 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 come here. Don't ever, ever do that. Don't ever, ever look during a show at your, and he, and he showed me the abuse that he had. And I was like, that, you get that, Jake. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, wow, like that's a joke. And he said, don't ever, ever look at your social media. So I never, ever look at my social media do, during any show. And now I've stopped looking at it, at it in general. Um, but even though the other day I, I, I did a game, and I didn't look at it because I knew to certain teams, I know that I will get a lot of abuse from. There's certain teams that just fans aren't very supportive. So yeah. I chose not to look at it and I I, I, I don't now. And um, my agent rang me when I was, do, I was doing another show and he was like, I'm just checking you're okay. And I was like, yeah, why? He's like, well, I'm just checking about the social media abuse that you got. I was like, I haven't even looked and it still brings attention that a newspaper report then got all the stuff find you in and then it gets to you anyway so even when you do retract yourself away from it it finds a way of coming back to you um but i think that you just have to ignore it and i spoke to alex scott about it quite a lot recently because she's had she's been vocal about it she's had a lot of abuse as well um and it affected her mental health and i just think you, you just you just don't look at it and i think it is the same when i was a kid playing football like my mum said just out one ear and you know in one ear and out the other and um it's the same as social media like use the platform to to your to your strength and and don't look at the rest of it it does seem a, a shambolic sort of way in which the world works though doesn't it that if those kind of comments were printed in the newspaper say 10 years ago there would have been recourse but because it's this wide cesspit of bile it's just impossible to police it coming from all over the world and sometimes Kaz as well when you when you actually look down into it and, and actually think who the hell has sent you this you'll find out they're the mental health advocate talking about be kind to each other duh, duh, duh. and then three days later they're sending you absolutely disgusting pelters out of nowhere i mean they, they let themselves down apart from anything else I think I think the worst one I got was when I was at Chelsea, and uh, I got death and rape like comments and like threats, and I like reposted it and saying like just you know it obviously bothered me because I do ignore a lot of stuff, but for that moment it must have hit home, and I think it, they said die of leukemia, and, and I've had my nan die of it, and my mum's obviously been very sick previously, so it really hit hit a nerve for me. And so I re I put like this is the abuse that you get, you know, out in that person. Then it went all it went mad, and it was just then that person then can change their name and do it again. And it was the and I think the scariest thing was my uncle was driving and he heard that I had these threats and it it goes mad. And then it was like, is she okay? Is my niece all right? Da -da -da. And your family are worried and, and then it's on the news and then and then. But you know what's the most ironic thing? Is that no one ever went to me? Are you okay? Because I'd seen it on so many platforms and so many things. They all just like I was in the dressing room at Chelsea and it came up on Sky Sports News and the players were watching it and I was stood next to them and not one player went, "Kaz, you all right?" Like that's that's about you. There was just no concept of it and it was like I, I just that's why I find social media astounding. I, I think the, the the big words that you can always ask to someone is, "Are you okay?" And don't token gesture it like you know don't be like are you doing you okay if, if you're not interested in asking how they are don't ask the question but it is the most vital question you'll ever ask for anyone especially in this current climate are you okay how are you it's so important and it matters to people do you, do you think you'll get to a stage over the next few years where you are a pundit who was a footballer rather than being a former footballer who's now a pundit i.e. will you put your current profession at the start of your gonna sound poncy here elevate a statement or yeah. do you think you'll forever be a former footballer i think in time if i'm like how i am you know if you look at my football career i never rested and i never rested on my laurels for me the best thing now would be karen carney the pundit like football's gone you know it's been and gone move on type of thing i'd like to be when you turn on the TV or radio, that that female is, is a great pundit. And that's what I want. I think, you know, that's your current job. That's what I am. I think um, it's really weird. Like, you know, you talk about football. If you walked into to where I live right now, you would never know that I was a footballer. 
There's not one bit of memorabilia to suggest that I was a footballer. Not one bit in this place. Um, and I think that's just my mentality is move on, you know, go and try and nail this career and be the best that you can be in this industry. So I think eventually I'd like to just be known as the, as the pundit. One or two of your former teammates are making a name for themselves as coaches. I mean, Casey Stoney at Man United's an, an obvious case. Is, is that something that has ever interested you, could ever interest you to get involved back in the game in that ca capacity? I think in, in, you know, you never say never, do you? But uh, for me, I've been quite, you know, my dad wants me to coach, I think. I think he thinks it, I should. But uh, I've always made it very clear. And my mum's just like, you've, you've never had a passion for it. And I think my mum knows my passions. Um, and also, just because you played the game doesn't mean you, you'd be a good coach or a coach. So um, I enjoy the tactical side of it. Um, I, don't, I don't like the cold weather, so I probably wouldn't like being a coach, if I'm honest. Yeah. I, you're a lady of my own heart. I, once you've been involved with football for a couple of decades, the cold really starts oh. to get to you. I went to the opening of the new Wimbledon Stadium a few weeks ago. Man, I had about five layers on and it was still getting down my neck. Absolutely. You need the heat, you need the heat you Yeah, I know. I need to get that sorted out. I, I need a piece of advice for you. Your number one piece of advice, your number one piece of advice that you would like to share with everybody. Um, I think it would be to have fun. Uh, I think. Uh, I've spoken a lot lately about like my career and, and where I've been similar to this, these conversations. And I think when I first broke onto the scene as a kid, you know, as a 17 year old, I literally didn't have a care in the world. I, I played like it was street football. I played like I didn't have a care in the world. And then in the middle part of your career, you, you don't have that license from other people and you put that pressure on yourself. And then, in the last year of my career, because I knew I was retiring, I went back to the 17 year old mentality. And the regret I had was I should have done that the whole career. Really enjoyed it, had fun, played with a smile on my face and not had a care in the world. And it's been similar in the punditry role recently where I've probably been, been too serious and working so hard and so caught up in the moment that I forgot that just have fun and kind of like just, just go out and see how long it lasts, enjoy the moment. And it's actually a lot of people say when I have that attitude where I, perhaps not that I don't care, where I don't have that care element, I, I, I perform better. So my one bit of advice would just be to constantly have fun, just smile and enjoy, enjoy every moment, literally. Um, and I think that's just from me, from my football career and now in the new role that I'm at, just enjoy it, just smile and, and enjoy the moment. It's a great piece of advice. Although I want to contrast it by saying this, I've had an absolute rip. I've, I, I, the, the honesty with which you share your story is inspirational, Cass, so thank you very much indeed. But I have teased this, so I think it's the only place for us to finish. Uh, we'll fade to my outlink when you've stared down your camera there and given us your best moody look, please, to finish. It's the only place we can finish, isn't it? Off you go. It's a killer, folks. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Mark Clement. Thanks for watching. Join us again soon for another one from our Global Insight Series.